Hello everyone, welcome to the Coin Brief Podcast, episode number 25. This is your open source for digital currency news, and today is November 28th, 2014. The Bitcoin price is sitting comfortably at $375 per Bitcoin, and today is Bitcoin Black Friday, which is the um, third Bitcoin Black Friday in in history and uh you know it takes the regular idea of black friday getting cheap deals uh online or in stores and applying it to bitcoin incentivizing people who hold bitcoin to go out and spend it get good deals on anything from computer components to game systems to i mean anything that you can think of it's available for buying with bitcoin and it's probably cheaper today as well Unfortunately, by the time our listeners get to this podcast, it, Bitcoin Black Friday will be <laughs> over. But um, I'm pretty sure well, there's still... You, yeah. If you put it up by Sunday, they'll still have Cyber Monday. Yeah, yeah. I was going to so say that. Most, um, most online Black Friday things last all the way through Monday. So. Right. Monday is Cyber Monday, and you could argue it's still Bitcoin Black Friday weekend all weekend. So definitely, if you're looking to... Um, you know, get whatever gadget or, you know, even clothing or whatever it is that you need, uh, go online and and go shopping for it and look for some pretty good deals. You know, even, even Reddit, um, is doing this deal where they are giving 25% off on Reddit gold for people paying with Bitcoin during Bitcoin Black Friday. So like, you know, uh, any, any kind of service that you, that you can pay for, uh, see if they are giving a, a deal to Bitcoin users this weekend and personally i freaking love uh the whole black friday thing uh, a few years ago i would go to the mall just to witness the hordes of crowds trying to get into clothing stores but uh now i am a little bit more calm about it and i just sit at home doing cyber shopping for awesome deals managed to pick up uh, some nice headphones and a new tablet as well lg g pad 8.3 from newegg.com during their Bitcoin Black Friday deals. So, uh, pretty pretty cool. Evan, do you do you participate in Black Friday at all? No, spending money is like pulling teeth to me. I hate it. Mm. So those bitcoins are f- um, planted firmly <laughs> in your gums. Yeah, it it takes a lot to part me with my bitcoin. Um, unless they go to a million dollars, then I might sell. I might sell one. But yeah. I've decided that I'm going to buy um, a decent headset for the podcast, though. I, th- I don't think um, – I'm going to get the one that you're wearing right now so the viewers can have an idea of what I'm going to be getting. It's the Turtle Beach. Um, yeah, Turtle Beach X12. As v- the viewers can tell, the sound quality is a lot better than what I've got going on right now. So I'm going to be getting that. I don't think there's actually a discount on it, a Black Friday discount on it, but I'm just yeah. – Gonna, I'm just going to get into the spirit of consumerism and buy one anyways. <laughs> Without it's, any it's not deal. That expensive. Yeah, yeah, it's not that expensive. So. You know, I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to get that on Amazon.com, you could buy a gift card with Bitcoin for Amazon.com and go through Gift and get that. And during Bitcoin Black Friday, they're giving 5% uh, points back, basically 5% cash back to users for using Bitcoin. Which is, you know, a slight improvement over their normal 3% cash back for Bitcoin purchases. But, you know, it's something. It's basically, if you're, if you're spending $50, then you get $1 back. So, eh, you know, there's definitely better deals out there, but, you know, it's something. Yeah, I'd, but honestly, I would rather just, you know, pay full price for something and... Use use Bitcoin with either Overstock or Newegg, and give them my money for act and, and reward them for actually accepting Bitcoin instead Directly, of taking right. instead of taking a roundabout way to get something from Amazon who has so far refused to do anything about Bitcoin. So right, right, right. Well, uh, definitely, users uh, or listeners, um, go check out uh, Black Friday deals. So uh, let's get into recent news in the past couple of weeks concerning Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, 
so one of one of the things that kind of went viral and got a lot of attention in the past week was this so-called reporter slash journalist on this website called ZDNet, which is apparently a, a pretty prominent tech publication online. And apparently they, they have this one journalist there who has been talking crap about Bitcoin for like about a year. And he wrote a recent article this week that got a, got a ton of attention, basically saying that Bitcoin is illegal under the U.S. Constitution. And he started sending letters to U.S. senators arguing that Bitcoin should be banned and, you know, it, it can't be used to pay taxes. Therefore, it's, it's illegal or something. And this, this article got like a ton of attention in the community. People started tweeting at him. Uh, Eric Voorhees challenged him to a debate. Bruce Fenton uh, made some really good points uh, against him. And basically everyone just piled onto this guy, basically telling him why why his arguments are bullshit. And honestly, like, he might just be a big fat troll uh, who doesn't really believe any of the arguments that he's making. And he just wants to start some crap uh, with the Bitcoin community and see if he can get any extra ad ad views for his, for his crappy article. So, yeah, Evan, what do you think about this uh, loser who doesn't really understand Bitcoin and has dedicated a lot of his professional career into <laughs> trying to take it down. He just, he just wants attention and um, he's, he got it. He succeeded because the subreddit went crazy. But I, I, I actually didn't even read the article because what caught my attention was at the top of the uh, subreddit, there was a link to a tweet he made and he said, something along the lines of yes of course bitcoin is illegal and yes of course i'm going to actively lobby to ban it um when i saw that i was just like this guy is just uh he's just full of bs he's, he's trying to be an, he's, he's trying to be antagonistic yeah he, he just wants attention he doesn't know what he's talking about um so and then and then when you told me earlier today before we started recording that he was using the Constitution to uh, yeah. to back up his claim of it being illegal. I, you know, I I said to you the first thing I said to you was, oh, he's talking about the clause where it says uh, where it gives Congress authority to set weights and measures for currency. Um, but that that in no way gives the federal government legal tender status. Um, what what that provision comes from. It, uh, is way back when we actually used to use gold and silver coins, uh, merchants actually had to verify the purity of the gold content and the mm -hmm. silver content in the coins. So they needed a trusted third party to uh, test the content of the coins and verify them. Um, so people just naturally, for whatever reason, went to the government and decided to trust the government with that. So... Over time, yeah, they naturally. evolve. They evolve policies of uh, putting their stamp on coins to guarantee their purity, and then that just they started minting their own coins, um, and that's and that's why that is in the Constitution because we didn't we didn't always use paper money. We actually used to use coins made of gold and silver, and the government just guaranteed their purity, and they even went into the business of minting their own. Um, but that authority in no way gives them legal tender status and saying that all other currencies are illegal so yeah that's that's a big load of BS that that guy pulled if if he really if he was really wanting to have some like legal legitimacy to his claims he should have used the National Banking Acts of, of 1863 and 1864 because that, that's mm -hmm. when legal tender came in that's when we got the greenback which is what we call the dollar today um, but the fact that he didn't do that simple research and, and figure that out uh, just proves that he doesn't actually care about this. He just wants attention. So yeah, it's... and I, I think part of the reason why he would cite the Constitution as his as the basis for his argument is that he he would get less attention if he were to just cite some 
law from 1863. It carries more weight when you're saying this is illegal under the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. And, you know, he's, he's he's contacting senators right. and getting them to comment on it as well. And, like, the only way he can hope to actually get their attention and get a significant response from them is by making it sound that, you know, Bitcoin is inherently unconstitutional, which is, you know, yeah. politicians throw that phrase around a lot and it gets attention sometimes in the media. So he's basically saying it, cryptocurrencies are unconstitutional and that's why they are legal. But I just want to point out uh, the and cite the particular clause that he's talking about it's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5 of the Constitution, and I'll just read what it says right now. It's just one line. Uh, to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. So, if, you know, if, if, the, if the United States government did not create this money, then it's not legal currency, is, is his argument. Uh, but even even if it's not legal tender designated by the by the government doesn't mean that stuff that is not that is is inherently illegal people have been using private money for eons uh even in today's age there's all kinds of random virtual currencies floating around that aren't necessarily cryptocurrencies there's in-game currencies for video games People still transact gold and precious metals occasionally as if they were currency. Oh, I'll give you these five gold coins for that product if you're willing to accept it. And this kind of stuff happens all the time and no one's going after those people because it's it's really kind of pointless. So, And Bitcoin just kind of fills that uh, one area of private money. So this guy is really fighting a losing battle and, and it's really pathetic, honestly. Uh, I would I would like to see a, a debate with him. Maybe maybe I should contact him and see if he's willing to debate me. But then at the same time, like he really just wants the attention, and it might not be worth it to even to even give any sort of credibility to that sort of argument because we've we've tackled this issue before and whether or not Bitcoin is is actually money or not, and it is it it, it is defined as money in a practical sense. And even in a legal sense, under certain court rulings, it's been defined as money. So, this guy is just this guy's just fighting a, a losing battle. Does he does he have any credibility to back up his complaints and arguments? No, not none, none at all, from what I can tell. And you know, like I said, with the the National Banking Acts of of eighteen sixty three and sixty four, the fact that he used that he made a constitutional argument, which is totally and obviously false, instead of using those those two um, congressional acts, which would have made his arguments a little bit more legitimate, but not really. But um, the fact that he chose to use the constitutional claim just proves that he wanted um, he wanted attention, because everybody knows the Constitution pretty much nobody really knows the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864. So. Um, it's just an attention-grabbing scheme. I saw one person on Reddit say that he's probably just writing this article to drum up um, attention so he could get a lot of people to read his Black Friday article. Um, mm. So he could so he could get a little boost in ad revenue from that, which makes sense. But yeah, I think we should just let him fade into obscurity like we did with uh, Professor Bitcoin and yeah. every, every once in a while just laugh at him and uh, yeah. let him just become kind of like a joke in the community. Yeah, and you know, this is just the beginning. We're still in the infancy of cryptocurrencies. Well, not really the infancy anymore at this point, maybe the adolescent stage of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So like as, it, as this whole project and as this whole community ages and gets more mature, there's still going to be those other people in the world who look at this thing and are critical of it for, for one reason or another and are going to try and construct some kind of uh, stupid argument in favor of their messed up opinion. And and we're never really going to be able to escape these people. They're always going to be exist uh, existing. This particular guy apparently has written tons of critical articles about Bitcoin in the past. It's just that this one kind of got the most attention because... 
he managed to get an actual response from a United States Senator, Tom Coburn, who responded and said, oh, yeah, if if it, if there is a constitutional conflict, then I'll, I'll carefully monitor the use of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. But even that isn't, isn't a real concern because this one senator isn't going to have the power to create any any sort of actual attack on bitcoin you know actual courts actual courts and enforcement agencies of the united states government know what bitcoin is they already have an eye on it and they're basically okay with it they're still trying to understand how they should use it in the legal system but even even if senators are still opposed to it and don't really understand it, it doesn't really matter because the the actual people who have the power in the US government are already looking at this and are trying to put it into their the, their little puzzle of of laws and how they should deal with it so it's not it's not really a concern even if he gets the attention of one United States senator and even you know we we still have organizations like the coin center and the bitcoin foundation although it's winding down its lobbying efforts those types of people are trying to educate Congress about what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are. So I'm I'm assuming that those people have a lot more influence on senators' opinions than some random writer from a technology website who, you know, basically sends out mass spam emails to senators trying to get a response. So he got lucky. He got lucky by getting a response from this senator. And he got ad revenue off of, off of this. Yeah. Plus, the Federal Reserve itself, you know, the, uh, what is it called? The, the chair or the council or whatever, the, whatever it is, Janet Yellen and like her 12 cronies. Oh, yeah. Um, Fed they, chairman. They meet, yeah, they meet periodically. Even even they've said that that Bitcoin doesn't pose an existential threat to the dollar or the economy or anything. And they're they're the be all end all of the financial sector. What they like their their word is law essentially. So they have the most power. The the Federal Reserve has essentially put their stamp of approval on Bitcoin, saying that it's not it's not a threat. It can be you know it can be used alongside other currencies and not and not overpower them so, so even, even if his constitutional argument did have did carry any kind of water congress wouldn't really care because the federal reserve has already kind of given it an okay and since when does congress care about the constitution in the first place so the guy doesn't really he doesn't really have any firm ground to stand on he's just trying to draw up attention Yep. And we have succeeded in not even mentioning his name. So there there you go, loser from uh from that <laughs> website. Um best best of luck to your uh, ne- uh, future crappy articles that are not based in any sort of reality. So, moving on to something else that kind of went viral in the past week is a Western Union ad that Bitcoin community users took and kind of modified for Bitcoin, basically. And where Western Union was advertising that it costs $5 to send $50 across the world, the Bitcoin users modified it to say that, you know, Bitcoin can send any amount of money instantly anywhere in the world to anyone for almost zero dollars basically just a few cents so once this ad was made people were posting it everywhere it originated on reddit but then people started posting it on twitter as well as on facebook and then surprisingly it actually got some kind of response on facebook actually a negative response someone flagged the advertisement and said that it infringed on copyright somehow we're not entirely sure if it was western union themselves but Facebook agreed that it that it was some sort of copyright infringement and took down the ad, which once that got out, people started posting to Facebook even more, and you got the whole Streisand effect going. So, uh, do you do you think that this is this is good ad- advertising for Bitcoin to 
basically try and take Western Union, Union head on with these types of crowdsourced advertisements? Yeah, it it was really great. One, the quality of that side by side Bitcoin ad was really good. Yeah. Um, the Western Union ad was professionally done by people with marketing degrees, and the Bitcoin ad was just some dude on Reddit. This is yeah. <laughs> made it in Photoshop. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it plus, actually when it when it started, uh, it, the the ad said, well, the Western Union ad says send send warm wishes today, and the Bitcoin ad was changed <laughs> to say yeah. send warm satoshis twenty four seven. And oh, some the, people were like, that's the one kind I'm of, looking at right now. The one that, I'm looking at right yeah. now says warm wishes, but also yeah. down they at the moved, bottom, they Western Union afterwards. says Western Union says moving money. F- uh, for better and Bitcoin says moving money far better and yeah. far is underlined. That's a that's a clever change right there. I like that. <laughs> and they drummed up a lot of attention. It was these parody ads filled up the front page of the Bitcoin subreddit. That's all that was there for like three or four days. And one thing I saw was the official Western Union Twitter sent out a tweet saying uh what are you, you thankful for this Thanksgiving? And then there was just a string of comments, everyone saying, I'm thankful for Bitcoin because, and then there were some people says, I'm thankful for Bitcoin because it allows me to send money uh, much faster and cheaper than Western Union. Yeah. And um, I don't I don't know how many followers Western Union has, but I'm sure it's a lot. So there's there were thousands of people exposed to Bitcoin just from people commenting on a tweet. Mm-hmm. And they commented, they were, motivated to comment because of this hilarious ad war between the bitcoin subreddit and western union so yeah, yeah. it's kind of it's, like a david and goliath goliath situation yeah that stoner just flinging it at them even if it didn't achieve anything as far as spreading bitcoin awareness it was good fun for a few days because i thought they were all hilarious yeah and apparently according to coindesk it actually it was Western Union who filed that DMCA copyright claim on the on the picture. Apparently, it was actually a person named Aaron Scholl, who is an assistant legal analyst at Western Union, filed the claim on the Facebook ad and, and got that taken down. So, uh, and then Western Union told Ars Technica that it takes all brand matters seriously and take steps it deems necessary to protect its intellectual property. Really? Really? This little square ad that really doesn't take much effort to create is so valuable to you that you have to make sure that this guy can't post it to Facebook. Okay, yeah, try and try and take that approach to the thousands of other people who are posting that now across social media. Plus, I saw a few people talking on Reddit mentioning that there is some kind of parody clause in copyright code and mm. of course of course random redditors aren't lawyers but they they said that um the law allows people to use other companies ads like this if they're doing it as a parody if they're making fun of it so if that's true i have no way of knowing if that's true because i'm not a lawyer and i'm not going to look it up cuz it's not that important but if it is true, then they really had, they really had no right to file this claim. So the fact that the Bitcoin community took it in stride and just made a mockery of the whole thing is just even more, even more um, justice handed to Western Union because they made a completely baseless claim and they paid for it. Yeah, and I guess uh, some people kind of adapted to that apparent you know whatever they they claim a copyright claim and you can't use their particular ad even if you're making fun of it well they just changed the words western union to western onion <laughs> okay yeah. it's not copyright I, infringement anymore i saw that one i saw that one it was that one was my favorite one yeah so yeah, and that's that's really that's really great because it still has the effect people still see that and they they know what it's talking about they know that this Bitcoin thing is being compared to this Western Union old type of remittance services. But the fact that it says Western Onion 
on the picture kind of shields people a little bit from any future DMCA takedowns that might be attempted. But even then, like, I, I see no problem with sharing the one that says Western Union. Like, yeah. who cares? Screw these guys. Make a better yeah. service if you wanna if you wanna try and compete. Nice try, Western Union, but not this time. Yeah, not this time. I think we won today. We win every day. We win all the time. <laughs> I mean, like, obviously, when you actually look at the actual basic functions, Bitcoin is inherently superior to Western Union. And in a way, I almost feel like it's all—it's not—it's kind of pointless to actually go head to head with them and try and point out the things that Bitcoin is better because it's it's fairly like it's 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 obvious that it's that it's better and the, there's still going to pe be people who are uninformed and keep using western union because they think it's the only way to transfer their money uh, out of the country to relatives in a in a different nation and they're willing to spend those 5 bucks to spend $50 but th the actual technology of bitcoin is inherently superior and just just honestly just give it like another year or so and there's going to be a Western Union type company that makes remittances just brain dead easy. We already have companies <laughs> like that in the Bitcoin space, but they're going to get even easier and easier and more efficient and more user friendly as time goes on. So it's really just, it's, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's hilarious basically. Yeah. There's, there's really no denying that, um, Pound for pound, dollar for dollar, Bitcoin is faster, better, cheaper than any other remittance service. And that's why a lot of people say that Bitcoin is really going to shine in the third world and developing countries. Um, they're going they're going to they're really going to bring them an advanced market economy to those countries uh, because Bitcoin is just so, so easy to yeah. use. It's so easy to transfer to those people. So. It's it's going to happen eventually, if not Bitcoin, some other kind of blockchain-based thing. So Western Union might as well just embrace it, start using Bitcoin themselves. They'll stay in business longer. <laughs> yeah, there you so, go. Kind of make their service so more competitive. Kind of kind of how taxi cars are starting to reduce their rates a little bit in response to comp yep. competition with Uber and Lyft. So as new technology gets invented and makes things easier and more efficient, the existing players who have traditionally held a dominant position in the economy kind of have to start thinking of new ways to basically keep, keep their market share or, or keep some sort of influence. And by adopting the new technologies, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So I will not be that surprised if we see Western Union start to maybe adopt bitcoin technology and it wouldn't it wouldn't be that hard either even currently you could achieve some type of rudimentary rudimentary uh remittance function by just using circle to purchase bitcoins and then sending the bitcoins to someone else and then having them just cash out using circle in another country and that's pretty easy if you know how to do it and that's just one method that circle isn't even designed for remittances, but you can still do that anyway. So there's all kinds of options being built, and Western Union is, is far from being like the only remittance option these days. And it's honestly it's just going to start dying out. So uh, let's move on to to another piece of news. Um, the Bitcoin Foundation is a hot topic in the community and also has been a hot topic on our podcast in the past. We have criticized them for using money in stupid ways uh, to try and lobby governments to get favorable legislation and other just poor choices in board members. You know, Mark Carpolese comes to mind, Brock Pierce, we've talked about him as well. But now the Bitcoin Foundation has announced a major shift in their strategy. They have decided to basically focus on core development of the Bitcoin code and start to draw back their efforts of education, policy, and outreach initiatives 
and just focus on core development. Start paying developers more, hire more developers for testing the actual code of Bitcoin, and basically try and back off the whole lobbying efforts, which they got so much criticism for, which I have criticized them a lot in the past for. I, I mean, found out that they were using at least $100,000 to pay a couple of high-profile lobbyists in, in Washington, D.C., for God knows what kind of results. Uh, I'm I'm really glad to see this type of announcement come out of them. That they're gonna they're gonna start drying that back and focus on core development. So, Evan, do you what do you what do you think about this development? I think it's great. The whole reason I've been bashing the Bitcoin Foundation for the last what is it three or four months now, maybe even five months. Um, I've, I don't think I've, with the with the exception of their um, ALS campaign they did back in August, I've never said a single good thing about the Bitcoin Foundation. I don't yeah. think. Yeah. So, and m my whole reason for it was that they they completely deviated from their mission statement, their official mission statement, which was to, which was to standardize core development fun core development and spread general awareness. Yeah. Uh, i.e. Help, helping companies accept Bitcoin and teaching people how to use wallets and things like that. Never made any mention of lobbying governments or anything. Uh, but then at some point they just decided to take the community's money, take their members' money um, with without necessarily getting their permission to use it in this way and just give it to politicians and governments and bureaucrats and I as, as soon as they started doing it I knew it wasn't gonna work um, I, I knew it was gonna lead to bad results I knew it was gonna be a big waste of money we were gonna get really bad legislation out of it and what happens we get bit license in New York yeah. and then what did they do about that they just write them a couple letters uh, begging them to give them some additional information that they may have withheld or to Talk with us a little bit more, so yeah, we can try and so catch them get... in a legal misstep. Oh, you didn't give us all the research documents that you did. Ha ha, yeah. we got you. <laughs> try trying to get them to, to talk to the foundation a little bit more, so we they can get positive legislation if there is such a thing. And I I knew it was all going to fall apart. I knew nothing good was going to come of it, and that's that's exactly what happened. Um, they Lossky made a few concessions on bit license but it's ultimately going to be the same exact thing and it's still going to be restricting <laughs> and how much money have they one how much money did they pour into new york i don't know but they have millions of dollars and they've at least a hundred thousand of it they've given to this lobbying firm to lobby dc so who knows how much money they've spent on lobbying governments unsuccessfully so yeah. The fact that they're finally listening to the community and they're just backing down and they're going to give Gavin Andreessen more money and they're going to increase his budget, I think that's pretty huge. And I don't I don't really have much reason to hate on that because that's what I've been telling them to do this whole time was to focus on core development, make the protocol better, then we won't have to worry about bad regulation. So Yeah. We kind of got I, them... Like yeah. Maybe not us personally, maybe we were just a, a voice in the in crowd. General. But yeah, the community got them to make this pretty big change that a lot of people were criticizing them for in the past, and they have changed their ways. So honestly, like mad props to the Bitcoin Foundation for taking this pretty big step in the right direction. Now, that, well, first of all, I'll, I'll talk about like what exactly they're going to they're gonna do in terms of hiring new developers they are going to bring on at least one additional full-time developer for testing. So that's going to join the original team, Gavin Andreessen, Vladimir, who are already part of that team. They're going to have a new tester. And also they're launching at least four developer training and certification workshops around the world starting in 2015. So that's all great. They're using their, they've got a lot of money. They collect a lot of membership dues from very successful companies in the Bitcoin space. And they're going to start putting it towards actually improving the code and 
educating people who want to improve the code as well. So that's that's all great. Now, that's not to say that nobody is going to be lobbying governments on behalf of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. That function has actually been transferred to a relatively new organization called the Coin Center. This is an organization that was uh, created by Jerry Brito, who is now the executive director, and they have the support of VC investors like Mark Andreessen. So they've got some weight behind them. And they actually, their stated goal is to basically lobby governments and educate policymakers uh, about possible laws that could be made concerning cryptocurrencies. So that whole lobbying arm of the community, if you can classify them as part of the community, has just been transitioned to a to a different organization that is probably going to get less scrutiny than the Bitcoin Foundation did because the Coin Center doesn't actually have Bitcoin in their name and they're relatively new. So they can kind of do these lobbying efforts relatively well, they aren't really in the public eye as much anymore as the Bitcoin Foundation was when they were doing this. So we still have to keep an eye on the Coin Center, make sure that they aren't trying to lobby governments in favor of the Bit License or anything like the Bit License. So we still have to be on the lookout for bad lobbying efforts. But the Bitcoin Foundation itself, great on them for, for taking this step and focusing on something that we have all been pushing them towards uh for a long time so yeah and i i think the coin center is overall less of a threat too because i think they'll be have significantly less funding than the foundation did because like you mm -hmm. said their their stated goal is to lobby for regulation and they have to make they have to get donations based on that mm -hmm. the the foundation made their money by saying, pay us the, become a member, pay us dues, and we'll use your money to standardize the code and increase the development capacity of the Bitcoin community and spread general Bitcoin awareness. And that's how they got this huge influx of members and all of their money. And then they just, after they did that, they said, well, now we're going to start lobbying. So yeah. Yeah. if they, the Coin Center is starting out saying that they're going to lobby. They're being honest about it, which I have to respect them for that. They didn't lie about the um, about it like the Bitcoin Foundation did, or at least they didn't start out with one goal and then switch to another without really telling anyone. Dupe everyone. Yeah, so they're at least being honest about it, but they're still going to be lobbying for the regulation, the positive regulation that doesn't exist. They're, all of their efforts are... Most likely going to be fruitless in the in the long in the the long term in the grand scheme of things. It's not really going to accomplish much, but for that reason, I think they'll be less funded, so they'll be significantly less powerful than the Bitcoin Foundation. Yeah, and that's a great point to make that they aren't duping people anymore. They aren't saying that their mission is one thing, and then behind the scenes they're doing something totally different. That. <laughs> Not only a lot of members probably disagree with, but a lot of people in the community who are passionate about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies disagree with. So the Coin Center is an entity that is honest about what they're doing, and they're, they're still going to get a lot of funding because there's a lot of people with a lot of money who do want to see some type of regulation. People who don't think that Bitcoin can achieve its full potential without some kind of regulatory framework. And some of them are genuinely afraid that Bitcoin would get outright banned by the government and people like Tom Coburn, who might stupidly listen to a journalist who emails them complaining about Bitcoin. <laughs> so they, they, they are, they're just honest about what they're doing now. And they're going to get a lot of money from people like Mark Andreessen, Barry Silbert, uh, and even developers like Jeff Garzik support the coin center and its its policy education efforts so there's a i mean it's a weird term but there's a market for these policy education <laughs> and there's people who want to help fund that and pay for that but yeah it's definitely a good thing that this is 
uh, being done honestly and not being duped on people who pay into Bitcoin Foundation membership dues thinking that they're paying to help support the core code. Now if you are have a, if you have a successful Bitcoin company and you contribute membership dues to the Bitcoin Foundation, now though you can be reasonably sure that those dues actually go towards development of the core code, helps pay Gavin Andreessen's salary and other developers and testing of the code and things like that. So it, you know, pretty 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 good move by the foundation overall. And it's glad that it's it's good that they separated these two things. I'm definitely gonna be watching the coin center though. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be just as hard on them as I was on the Bitcoin Foundation because my I I was really hard on the Bitcoin Foundation but it wasn't because I disliked the foundation just because they they were there. It was because yeah, sure. I, re I, really, <laughs> I really dislike useless regulation. So anybody, anybody who lobbies for that kind of stuff, if, uh, I mean, I'll give you a hard time. Mm -hmm. so, so now you can go after the, the coin center. The, yeah, the, I'll, be, I'll be going after the coin center maybe in the near future as they respond to things like the second draft of bit license and whatever they do in DC, but it'll yeah. honestly be probably be harder to keep up with them than the Bitcoin Foundation because, like you said, they are going to be uh, much less publicized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're they're classified as a think tank basically, so they're in the same league as organizations like the Heritage Foundation, yeah. which advocates for all kinds of conservative policies in Washington D.C. And e even with that, which is a very high profile think tank the general public and the and the media at large don't really know a lot about what's going on with them what they're advocating for so it definitely will be a little bit harder to keep up with but hey that's our job as journalists right try and research these things and find out what's going on that's right um a, a little tangent to this issue that i also want to mention is when the bitcoin foundation announced they were going to start leaning towards core development more they actually surprisingly got a, some criticism for this for this move <laughs> uh one of the most high profile critics of this move was peter peter todd who is a core developer of bitcoin and a very influential member in the community he actually came out very heated against them and said that they were trying to centralize core development work of Bitcoin by by focusing on core developing and he actually he got into an argument with the Bitcoin Foundation executive director Patrick Merck over Twitter and you know they were arguing about what does centralization actually mean uh, would it be damaging to Bitcoin adoption and basically just going back and forth over this topic and I like I was really surprised to see a prominent critic come out against this move because I thought this is something that most people in the community were pushing for for a long time is uh is is more funding for core development but Peter Todd's overall argument was that they're trying to centralize bitcoin core development by providing more funding to it does that argument <laughs> hold any weight in in your mind that just seems like a really bad argument to me. I don't I don't want to completely bash Peter Todd because I don't really know much about him, but just based on the little Twitter storm he had, it's his it doesn't make any sense. Like he he says that core development will become more centralized because it's high it's it has more funding now. Well, yeah. He, even before they made this decision, the Bitcoin Foundation, um, Gavin Andreessen's team, and his little development department in the foundation was already the most highly funded team of developers in the community. So, it, yeah, so it was if, already centralized to a certain we're, extent. Yeah, if we're going if we're going by funding, it was already centralized. And to take it a step further, Satoshi Nakamoto centralized core development when he gave Gavin Andreessen control over the notifications. The update notifications on the um, on the client, the the vanilla client, mm -hmm. 
if if he really wanted to be completely open sourced and market oriented, he would have just let control over that little part of the client fade away with him as he disappeared, and then nobody would be able to give every single person a little blip on their screen saying, "Hey, download this update." Everything would have to be based on how popular it is and how useful it is. But Satoshi decided not to do that. Yeah. So, and you know, back in those days, like. Satoshi Nakamoto, and he was the person who created Bitcoin. It was super centralized back then. He was yeah. the only person in the whole world who was working on this. And at this point, we're very lucky to have a pretty decent, large team. I think I don't know how much it is exactly, but a dozen, maybe a couple dozen core developers. And throwing more money into that crowd of people can only bring good things, in my opinion, because those are the smartest people in the whole freaking community who are working on this massive project that has huge implications for society and why wouldn't you want to pay those people top dollar and pay more of those people to work on the code and improve it so it seems like a common sense issue to me i definitely 100 percent agree with that i think i i honestly think that the core developers should be millionaires really i mean they're doing mm -hmm. they're probably doing the most important work in the, in the bitcoin community because yeah spreading spreading awareness and adoption and educating regulators and things that's that's super important but all of it is useless if we if we never get bitcoin out of beta yeah so yeah it's, it it's hasn't even reached 1.0 yet right what so what gavin and Dreesen is doing is arguably the most important work that's going on in the Bitcoin community. So he should, I think he should be mega rich, hmm. uh, just because of the just because of the responsibility he has and all of the pressure and politics he has to deal with from the community. Yeah. So, I, I'm not gonna criticize the foundation one single bit for get, for increasing Gavin's budget, because that's what I've been wanting them to do the whole time. Now centralization yeah we've already said it's been it's been centralized for a long time core development has but not but in ter in terms of access to the community and funding yeah but not actual centralization like it's it's not like the foundation is pushing people non-employees out of the market right. anybody can make any kind of patch they want and yeah they can they can broadcast it they can they can ask, you know, miners to accept it or whatever, or they can, or they can submit it to uh, Gavin and Dreesen and say, I, I really appreciate it if you reviewed my, my code, my project or whatever, and then implemented it if it's worthwhile. Anybody can do that. It's still entirely open source. So I don't yeah. know where he's getting where, where it's coming from that it's be becoming centralized. Yeah, one one theory that some redditor proposed was that. Peter Todd is actually trying to create, or he's a supporter of a particular workshop certification kind of thing where they certify developers uh, who would work on cryptocurrencies. And the, the theory goes that Peter Todd doesn't want a competitor in that space. He doesn't want the Bitcoin Foundation to do certification workshops and things like that because he considers that either his domain or the organization that he's in favor of, that's their domain. So, you know, that's, that's a, that's a possibility. I don't know if that, how much validity that has, but I can definitely see it. Uh, even core developers can, can have flaws and selfish interests. And I, I just find it, it's really hard to argue against some, something where the Bitcoin foundation is actually throwing hefty amounts of more money into into development so and yeah you mentioned that bitcoin is an open source project that doesn't that doesn't get you know emphasized enough especially to people outside of the community who don't know much about bitcoin it's open source the code is all public you can go look at it yourself you can contribute yourself you can test it yourself they always want more testers to test the code i would do it myself if i had any sort of education or or knowledge about coding which i might work on in the future but right now i'm just a journalist and commentator but they're always looking for people to test the code and contribute to the code and paying people to do that giving them incentives to do that and, and improve 
the code that we all use and that we all reap the benefits of every day by using this amazing payment system, there's absolutely nothing wrong with giving those people more money and incentivizing that particular uh, activity more to improve the overall system itself. So yeah, you, you know, good good job, Bitcoin Foundation. Ignore the haters. This is this is the weird twilight <laughs> zone that we live in, where we are in a way defending the Bitcoin Foundation for a new decision <laughs> they've made <laughs> from a from a core developer. I, I mean, they've they've decided to support the free market, and that's what I support. So I don't I don't I'm not. It's it's like with politics. I'm not a team player. I don't support Democrats or Republicans. I I support. I support whoever agrees with the things I support. Yeah. So I don't I don't care if it's I I don't care if it's Barack Obama. If he if he has a change of heart and starts talking about the free market all of a sudden, then I would I would be yeah right on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, so I don't. Everyone's everyone, I don't know everyone it ha- can redeem themselves and yeah. and do something that actually shows improvement and is a step in the right direction and when they do do those things we should applaud them for it honestly and show them that we we do care enough to to support them in that yeah so so i don't i don't actually i don't know anything about the that, that little conspiracy theory you mentioned with peter todd but too bad man i mean this this is a free market and there's no intellectual property in this cryptocurrency world. Yeah. Um almost, almost literally a lot of people even, you know, license their writing under Creative Commons uh on things on cryptocurrency. Our but videos are as, licensed under Creative Commons. As far as uh coding and stuff is concerned, it's, it's, it's right. It's this Bitcoin cryptocurrency in general, it's created this whole community that's dedicated to freedom of information, um, free market values, which contrary to what a lot of people believe, free market values does not include intellectual property. So mm. yeah, he can, he can have opinions about these certification programs all he wants, but he cannot become his his selected favorite organization cannot become a monopoly and they're just going to have to be better than the foundation yeah now the foundation so, is actually a player in the market so that's get that's used to it man because that's that's what the future is going to be it's going to be a free market so yeah moving on to other stories other news recently the fbi u.s marshals part of the u.s federal government announced that they will auction off 50,000 bitcoins worth about $20 million that were seized last year, part of the Silk Road bust when they arrested the so-called kingpin, Ross Ulbricht, leader of the massive Silk Road drug marketplace. So his trial was actually scheduled for this month, November, but it's been delayed till January but they're actually going to start selling the bitcoins that he allegedly possessed. They're going to sell it um, before then. And uh, the registration to bid already began and ends December 1st. And uh, there's a six-hour window on December 4th to submit sealed bids for the, for the bitcoins. So they're going to do it kind of the same thing as last time where... The Bitcoins are sectioned off into separate blocks of 2,000 Bitcoins each. And 10 of the blocks actually have 3,000 Bitcoins. So, you know, these are only, these are rich investors who are going to be bidding on this. It's a lot of the same names from last time, like Tim Draper, who won the original amount that they auctioned off in June, I believe. And... Uh, Billy uh, Bar- Barry Silbert, part of um, Second Market, is also going to be participating in the auction. And it's worth noting that the first auction earlier this year was for the 29,000 or so bitcoins, which were just user funds on the Silk Road website, so people who had gone on there to either buy drugs or sell drugs. But these 50,000 bitcoins 
were part of Ross Ulbricht's personal stash that he had collected over the years as his alleged role as Dread Pirate Roberts. So he collected a lot of money, and it's at the current exchange rate is worth $20 million, and the U.S. Marshals are going to make Basically, they're going to get that money in exchange for giving these Bitcoins away. So, yeah, Evan, what do you think about uh, the latest auction of Bitcoins? Actually, what I just now thought of is that even if Ross Ulbricht is, does go free, which he won't. I mean, let's be honest, he no, won't. Probably not. But if, if he does in some parallel universe, if he did, he would be completely penniless because... They're selling off all of his money, unless yeah. he unless he has some like buried in his backyard on a paper wallet or something. Um, yeah. But but anyways, that's just a, a random thought I had. But as for the auction itself, uh, um, my initial reaction was that I'm I'm surprised that it hasn't affected the price yet. Do you think it's going to affect the price at all? Well, last time after Tim Draper won 19 million dollars worth of Bitcoin. The price actually shot up after that, and some people believe that that was actually a contributing factor to the price rise from, I think it was in the 400s, and it rose past 600 in June, partially thanks to the to the auction, because the reasoning goes that the federal government selling off these bitcoins that they, that they seized as part of this drug raid thingy or whatever, it actually gives legitimacy to Bitcoin itself because it shows that Bitcoin is not illegal in and of itself. The government just doesn't like people buying drugs with it or selling drugs for it. But the actual commodity itself, the currency itself, is not illegal. And the government just wants to exchange it for actual cold hard cash. And the fact that there are large investors who are rich, who are willing to pay millions of dollars for this stash of digital currency that that has a strong psychological effect on on other potential investors and when they see that happen it's like oh wow number one it, it's legitimate in the eyes of the government it's fungible just because these were used in a massive drug operation drug trade doesn't mean that they're inherently tainted which is a topic that some in the bitcoin community have feared in the past but nope nope they're totally fungible. And then secondly, it shows that there's large investors who are willing to take on these millions of dollars worth of digital currency for whatever reason. Maybe they're hoping the price goes up or maybe they are planning to use it in a business venture like Tim Draper is. Tim Draper is planning to use those Bitcoins in third world countries to increase commerce there, increase remittances, it basically create a brand new business model that wasn't possible possible before. So I think those those are the types of reasoning that go into the argument that this is a bullish sign. I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that it'll it'll definitely increase the price, but if it does, it's probably for those reasons. Well, even before the winner was announced, even before the auction actually took place, if I remember correctly, the the Bitcoin price rose all the way leading up to the auction and then um a couple days before the auction there was a really brief dip which i chalked it up to to panic if people want to go back dig into the depths of coin brief and find my analysis on that you can it was actually pat myself on the back it was really accurate my predictions and then um and then the day of the day of the auction the price went up and then after the price has continued to go up because people were speculating on whether or not the winner or winners, uh, if if their bids were above, at, mm. or below market price, and yeah. so that that was that whole speculative nature of the of the auction is influenced the Bitcoin price, and that is, and I'm surprised that that's not happening um, again because it's an equally large amount of money and the the market price is significantly lower than it was last time. So yeah. there's there should be an equal amount of uncertainty as to whether or not the winners will uh, bid above or below market price. Last time, we don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm 
willing to bet money that um, Tim Draper bid above the market price. So is that going to happen again? That's that that's the kind of thing like I'm. That's the kind of thing that makes me surprised that this the speculation in the community isn't there because it was a huge thing over the summer and it influenced the price greatly. Yeah, um, there there's there's a ton of factors that go into the price. We talk about this a lot. There's tons of downward pressure factors and there's upward pressure factors. And right now, I think one of the major major downward pressure factors is something that I've talked a lot about before but I'm going to mention it again now is merchant selling pressure I think there's going to be a big spike in that in the next couple of weeks as merchants who typically don't hold Bitcoin and exchange their Bitcoin payments for cash and they have entities like Coinbase or BitPay doing that for them that results in, in Coinbase and BitPay collecting large amounts of Bitcoin in their reserves and they have to sell that eventually they don't want to hold more than 90%, probably not even more than 80% Bitcoin in their funds. So they have to try and sell that strategically somewhere. And I think we're going to start seeing that um, a lot in the next month as people are buying a lot of things with Bitcoin on Bitcoin Black Friday. And that money has to go somewhere. Not all of these merchants, especially the major ones like Newegg, Tiger Direct, these people don't want to hold Bitcoin because it's too volatile. So they have to sell eventually. And I think that kind of potential selling pressure in the very near future might cause speculators to be a little bit more cautious. And that's that's probably a bigger factor on their minds than this federal auction of 50,000 bitcoins and whatever speculative price that Tim Draper and Barry Silbert get those at. So... Um, it's, it's, we're still in a wait and see approach basically in terms of this. And I don't, I mean, I'm definitely, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of volatility in the next month as the price maybe crashes back down towards the 300 range and then maybe even spikes back up, uh, past 400 in light of the federal government auction. So definitely volatility, roller coaster ahead. And I don't, I, I It'll be fascinating to see how this shakes out uh, as 2015 begins and we see the, the probable conviction of Ross Ulbricht and as the government sells the rest of their Bitcoin reserves and as merchants kind of level out their, their, their Bitcoin funds, it'll be fascinating to see, to see where, we, where we end up in early 2015. Just ballpark guess here, I... I would say maybe 500 range um, around February, March 2015. So, um, yeah. Do you? What do you? What do you think? What do you think about that? Well, that's a good point uh, in reference to the auction because because yeah, the timing for this one is different than than the last one. This one is closer. It's obviously we have Black Friday going on, and it's closer to you know holiday shopping, Christmas shopping. So there. Yes, yeah, speculators would expect a lot of uh, merchant selling pressure to be hitting in the market soon. Plus, back in the summer during the first auction, uh, merchant selling pressure wasn't even a thing. We we still thought that mm. merchant adoption would always increase the price. We didn't find that out until we didn't find out that that was untrue until July when when, when Dell happened. Mm. So mm. that yeah. that wasn't even when... anybody's. Yeah, that's when announcements yeah. about new merchant ex- merchants accepting Bitcoin really just stopped having any effect on the price at all. So Yeah, so yeah. The, the merchant selling pressure wasn't even on people's radar during the first auction, so that would that, that definitely influences definitely would influence their speculation about the auction. But as far as going into 2015, I think there's always going to there's for the, first few, for the foreseeable future, there's going to be that baseline selling pressure from the merchants um, using Coinbase and BitPay, some s- smaller processors as their intermediary. Mm-hmm. So, but I definitely think there are some some bullish indicators. We have all this, all these new services coming out. Um, 
side chains might be or is going to be rolling out at some point. Plus, yeah. there's this company. There is this company called Bitwage, and it allows it. It provides a service to companies and allows them to pay their employees in Bitcoin. That that is a big deal because that makes holding Bitcoin less expensive because merchants sell their Bitcoin revenue to pay their expenses. They can't pay their expenses in Bitcoin. They have to pay it in dollars, whatever other kind of fiat that they may use. Mm -hmm. Wages are a part of that. So if if we, if it takes off, if this uh, bit wage thing takes off and people start getting their paychecks and wage it, or their paychecks on Bitcoin, that's that's one less expense they have to pay in fiat, mm -hmm. so they can hold a little bit more bitcoins. Then it takes a little bit of the selling pressure off. That's a bullish thing if it takes off, if it grows um, at a significant pace. And and even if it doesn't increase at a significant pace, the fact that you can even do that now is pretty huge. And you know we'll probably right. see that start growing gradually over the next few years. Right, and I think. Regardless of whether or not we, regardless of whether, regardless of what we think about regulation, it's very important in terms of price stability. So, no matter what happens, if we get super restrictive regulation or if we get completely free market policies being implemented, I think 2015 we're going to see a lot of uh, regulatory clarity, and that's going to have mm -hmm. a big impact on how investors decide to put money into Bitcoin. If they're going to put a lot, if they're going to put a little bit, or if they're going to sell, they already have. Regul regulatory clarity is, is huge, I think, because it, just that institutional um, just that institutional acknowledgement that Bitcoin is legitimate, it can be used in mainstream businesses, that, that'll bring a lot of really big players in. And I think, I think, the United States stance in particular and the rest of the world, of course, they're going to take a much more um, decisive approach to Bitcoin in 2015, I think, and that'll play a role on the price. So I think there's some bullish, some bullish indicators. There might be some, you know, 2015 might be a bullish year, but we do always have to pay attention to merchant uh, uh, selling pressure which is for the foreseeable future is going to provide a pretty strong baseline of downward pressure yeah, that it's we a have big to factor. constantly fight against. And one of the things that you didn't mention uh, is Open Bazaar. Open Bazaar is oh right, I forgot about that. Possibly a pretty huge underground X factor uh, for Bitcoin. Once that gets up and running and is easy to use, and people start transacting commerce on it. Not just buying drugs and, and porno and other things that are possibly black market, gray market types of things, but really anything that you can think of sold on there as a type of open, decentralized eBay type of thing. That's That would that would be pretty huge. Just have this one marketplace that everyone can go to, the one that everyone uses. So in that sense, it's kind of centralized in that everyone uses it, but it's not centralized in that it can't be taken down by anyone and there's literally no censorship on what can and can't be sold in terms of just regular physical products or digital goods or even services being sold on the platform. So once there's this one place that everyone can go to to transact anything that your heart desires, that's that, that would be huge for Bitcoin. And at least a slight bullish indicator once we get um, a dedicated uncensored free marketplace that everyone uses. I'm I'm really Open looking B forward to it. Open Bazaar is definitely going to benefit uh, the black market the that that are or the black markets that are operating on the dark net right now. It's it's de it's going to it's going to stabilize that market because it's going to be pretty much impossible for uh, national authorities from the United States and Europe to really catch these people because they're not they're not really I don't think they're really using any like super hacker skills or anything. They're just tracking packages. Mm -hmm. And they're they're tracing they're they're just following the packages back to the sender. Yeah, and that's the only way that, they can bust people. Yeah. 
eventually that leads them to the administrators and of course there's that one guy who registered his his uh servers on his real name but that's beside the point yeah so well that type of thing Bizarre, won't be able to happen anymore once right, open bazaar is up and running it'll it'll stabilize the black market which like it or not that's a huge part of the bitcoin economy black markets are a huge part of any economy regardless of the currency used so i think a lot of people don't realize that because it is black market and it's just so out of yeah. sight a lot of people but, just want to plug their ears and go oh that, that thing doesn't yeah. exist lots lots of people make their living on the black market i actually I actually read an article recently about a week ago about the system d economy and it's system d is just another term of saying like alternative gray market off the books and it's this there's this one economist in australia who's like dedicated the last 10 years of trying to estimate the gdp of this off the books um economy and he mm. estimates it to be at like 10 trillion dollars that's a lot of money so yeah so you, like it or not, black markets are, are a huge part of people's livelihoods. So anything that, that stabilizes them, that protects them from, from federal authorities or even from themselves, from, you know, like inter, intergroup, intercartel conflicts that often end up being violent. It's, it's been proven that that, that, that uh, internet black markets decrease that violence. So anything yep. that stabilizes the black market market is a good sign for any economy so of course it'll be a good sign for bitcoin yeah and the uh the cia doesn't like that that much and the, the overall federal government at large doesn't like that because they want control over people's lives uh they they want to be able to bust people and steal their assets steal their bitcoins uh put them in a cage and and wag their finger at them say you can't do this society at large can't do this while at the same time, behind the scenes, uh, running drugs between yeah. America and and cartels, which is what the selling CIA... guns to Mexican cartels, yeah, Eric Holder. <laughs> yeah. So the the federal government has some sort of working relationship with the cartels that are yeah. so demonized, and actually, this is a, this is a perfect thing to bring up. Just last week, Senator Mitch McConnell's family's business was caught with like a hundred tons of cocaine in one of their <laughs> cargo ships and the, like it's his wife's family but they have actually given him a lot of campaign funding over the past few years they wow. basically funded his entire political career and just recently it was discovered that their their company's cargo ship was shipping a hundred tons of cocaine so this stuff all happens underneath the underneath the veil anyway so bitcoin and cryptocurrencies actually are giving and technology in general are finally giving the regular people a way to just have more freedom transact how you want and f forget about what the government is doing what they say you can or can't do because they're all hypocrites anyway so yeah i 100 percent believe that that really big authoritarian leviathan government is an outdated relic of the 20th century and it's i think it's largely and i think it's largely due in part to the fact that technology just wasn't that great in the 20th century there and pretty much centralized government was really the most efficient way to conduct a society mm -hmm. but now we have all these decentralized methods uh, being developed that are trustless there you don't have to you don't have to rely on humans who are, are just naturally prone to error middle so, men. yeah middlemen so who are flawed it, it's not it's not going to be some huge libertarian revolution where we like overthrow the government or anything. And it's plant just plant our flag on top of the capital. <laughs> yeah, it's just we're 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 gonna we have we have be better governmental technologies. That's all government is. Right? It's a technology. It's it's a technology that is supposed to facilitate trade and improve set, society overall. Yes, yeah, set set definite boundaries that allow people to trade with each other. Um, I think. I think it's really important to understand that governments don't create economies, but economies create governments, and they are created to ensure the security of the economy, to 
protect people from having their property stolen or destroyed or whatever. So government is definitely an economic technology and it's going to evolve over time. Now, whether or not the politicians like that or not is a whole different story, but it's also debatable as to whether or not they'll be able to do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely, I think as the 21st century progresses, it's government is going to become an entirely different creature than what it is right now. Yeah. And you're, you're totally right that like so many functions that people expected government to do in the 20th century can now be done just using the most basic technological tools that we have at our fingertips right in front of us now. I mean, the most obvious example that happened very early on is the postal office getting you know right. outdated in the face of email and back in the 20th century that was the main way that people had to communicate um across large distances uh before the phone was invented uh people just you know sent letters to each other and then one, even once the phone was invented people still sent letters but like now we have email we have voice and video chat and <laughs> i mean all this stuff is is totally making all the old functions of of government and and just even businesses from the 20th century as well are just totally outdated <laughs> throwback to the western union thing <laughs> becoming totally outdated so yeah it's 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 a, it's a fascinating time to live in and and seeing all this happen before our eyes and it it definitely takes um a certain open mindedness to like look at all these things and be like okay how can i take all these tools to improve my life, improve other people's lives, uh, improve interpersonal relations, um, create new businesses that had, could have never existed before using old technologies. And like, it's a, it's a brave new world that, that we live in. And so many people are still waking up to this fact, really. Like there are still people who are advocating, uh, for the post office and saying that the post office should be funded more. And, and we need to legislate things to to make the post office more more powerful and like oh you know they're they're struggling for a reason they can't survive any longer in the new digital economy digital landscape ecosystem it's it's really amazing yeah, the only reason the only reason they're still around uh one because they're funded by taxes so it doesn't matter how unprofitable they are and two it's actually illegal for private companies to deliver first class mail, which is paper mail in an envelope. And really? so wow. Yeah, so people people have to rely on the post office to send them bills and things like that still. Huh. But even then, are, you know, a lot of people pay bills online now. So even that is kind of going out the window. Yep, yep. But yes, yeah, at some point they're just going to have to give it up because they're um they're going to go they're either going to go broke or they're going to piss a bunch of people off and that's not going to either one of those scenarios isn't going to be good so yeah, or they'll just die out like the be, dinosaurs they are <laughs> there's definitely going to be a lot of changes in the future yeah. uh, you know it's going to be pretty crazy times ahead yeah so um getting back to bitcoin payments and and stuff i just want to mention some stuff before we close out this podcast for today um <laughs> new places to send your bitcoin and support causes that you believe in uh the red cross now accepts bitcoin donations so you can donate to the american red cross and support their efforts for basically disaster relief which is going to be become a pretty prominent uh thing in, in the coming few decades as climate change worsens and people start getting hit by uh, worse hurricanes and snowstorms and, and heat waves. So definitely the Red Cross will be a great place to send bitcoins and help support people who are hard hit by disasters and tragedies. Uh, as well as the Red Cross, the Mozilla Foundation, which is the creator of the Firefox browser, and are, they're huge supporters of a free and open internet. They now accept bitcoin donations. So you can donate to, to Mozilla, uh, with your Bitcoin and support free and open open source internet browsers that way. So that's pretty great too. Uh, I want to mention ChangeTip as well. ChangeTip hit 10,000 
users uh, in one day uh, a week or two ago. ChangeTip has been going viral. ChangeTip is a service where people can send each other small amounts of Bitcoin, or even large if they want, but mainly it's used for small amounts. Send it to other people directly via some sort of social media account, like Reddit, or Twitter, or YouTube. Facebook is supposedly in the works. Once they get onto Facebook, that'll be pretty freaking huge. Uh, but they, they hit a milestone of 10,000 tips in one day, and over $40,000 transacted in tips in in one day so that's that's pretty crazy um did you want to did you want to comment on on these crazy ways of of moving money around um, that are now available well a cool story about change tip that happened recently was this guy posted on some subreddit called cheap living or cheap eating or something and he said that him and his kid were like in danger of being homeless they didn't have food to eat or anything and they needed suggestions for cheap eating and uh a bunch of Bitcoin users found that thread on that subreddit and started tipping him through Change Tip with Bitcoin, and they ended up, yeah, they, <laughs> they ended up uh, crazy. <laughs> giving him. He got a bunch of money. He got more than enough to pay for his food for a week, which is what he he was trying to figure out how to eat cheap and until he could find like another job or something. Yeah. Um. But then he actually got enough money to like buy, you know pay for Thanksgiving and buy Christmas presents and all this stuff. And it all happened through change tips. So that's pretty cool. That's awesome. And also another, another thing I want to mention is that the Ferguson public library started accepting Bitcoin donations. Yeah. Um, and Ferguson is significant because of the, all that mess that's going on with the, the kid that got shot and the, uh, officer Darren Wilson, yeah. Um, there's been a lot of rioting and looting and stuff, and people have been, people from all around the country have been trying to support businesses and, and things like that, trying to send them money to help them rebuild. Um, and the public library just, you know, I don't know if they've actually had any damage, probably not, because Hopefully who not. cares about a library, but... Yeah. Um, people are focused on going into malls and looting expensive products. No one's <laughs> yeah, trying like to steal Thomas books. Tank engine. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But they, they've they started, like, right in the middle of all that uh, mess going on, they started accepting Bitcoin donations, and the community, you know, really took it positively, and I think sent them a pretty hefty amount of money. So, yeah. that's, that's pretty, there's a lot of people in the Bitcoin community are really charitable. Not as charitable as Doge, but <laughs> that's to be expected because Bitcoin's a lot more valuable but although that could that could be are, debated within the recent the recent viralness of of change yeah, tip people are true, rivaling actually. doge now but yeah pe people in the bitcoin community are really charitable and uh, one it's great because it helps people and two it spreads bitcoin awareness so yes yeah. it's, it's really cool yeah i think i think part of the reason why bitcoiners can be so much more charitable than people who just use fiat is because it's just so damn easy to send money somewhere with the click of a button or the touch on your smartphone you can just send literally any amount of money you want to any organization any person that you want and it's like oh man i i feel so sorry for for the people who are living in ferguson and have to go through that chaos right now well I mean if if there was a if someone built the resource for like listing people in ferguson who have Bitcoin addresses, and you can just pick one and be like, okay, I want to support this person, I want to support this person. Or right now we have access to the library's donation option. I want to support free information and, and books in Ferguson, so you can support that with literally just minimal effort um, and just send money like that. So it's it's really, it's really great to see uh, basically easy ways of sending money now and literally m micro tips to anyone who is affected by any sort of event in the, in the country that yeah, impacts that's, negatively. I was actually going to say that, that peop, people can can give almost pretty much any amount they want. So really, with traditional payment processors like PayPal, or, and I'm sure there's like minimum transfer amounts because they have to pay for all these banking fees and stuff. So I'm sure you can't, 
can't donate like 20 cents through PayPal, maybe. I don't know. But I don't think with, so, no. But with Bitcoin, with Bitcoin, all you have to do is cover a really minuscule minor fee, which is like a penny or something. And you can send any amount you want. So you don't even have to necessarily be wealthy to be charitable with Bitcoin because you can just you can just send what you can afford to send exactly. and you know if if a couple thousand people you know send like 50 cents or a dollar that adds up to a bunch of money so it's definitely easier to be um charitable with bitcoin and i think it's going i think that's going to be a huge selling point in the future for bitcoin along with all the other stuff it's it's going to be really great for helping people yeah it's it's really just all about decentralizing how money works and giving people more freedom about how to use their money. And whether you choose to spend it on deals for headphones and tablets and, and video games and, and headsets and, and w whatever you want, or choose to give it to someone for free in favor of a cause that you believe in, no matter what it is, you have those options available to you and basically total freedom to, to choose how you want to use your money and it's just so much easier than trying to use a debit or credit card system or PayPal to send money to people. And the, the hard part is just getting a critical mass of people to actually use Bitcoin, getting people to actually uh, have a Bitcoin address so you can send it to them in favor of whatever cause they're, they're believing in. So that's, that's the uphill battle that so many great people in the community have been fighting over the past year. You know, just going back to change tip again, they allow you to tip people who don't necessarily already have a change tip account, and it encourages them to to create that account, create that virtual tip jar to hold for any future tips that that come in. So, yeah, it's it's really amazing how how money can be used to increase freedom and increase choice and increase your own influence on the rest of the world at, at large. So. You know that's that's the big picture that that really uh, it, it 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 illustrates the value of Bitcoin in my mind. Just how easy it is to send money everywhere. Yeah. All right. So, we're gonna wrap it up with that. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good place to end right. up. Um, yeah. So, you guys, uh, thanks for listening to the Coin Brief podcast. This has been episode number twenty-five, and um, thanks for listening. Uh, Please like our video, comment with your thoughts, follow us on Twitter, um, visit coinbrief.net, and um, be sure to tune in next week with uh, more news in the cryptocurrency space. I'll put descriptive links and stuff in the description of this video in case you want to look up anything that we talked about. And um, yeah, thanks for listening, guys, to the episode, the latest episode of Coinbrief Podcast. See you guys later. See you next week.